Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD, General Physician. All my video lectures are for educative purpose. This lecture will be very, very helpful to your fourth year student in your oral exam as well as in your theory exam. Also, it will be useful to even first year student, third year student also. And when you go for private practice. We'll be discussing today on one of the another interesting topic in neurology or we call CNS examination. We call difference between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. Very frequently asked as a short note, very frequently can be asked as even a full question. So we'll be first explaining you what is the pyramidal tract, how does it run, how it supplies, what is upper motor neuron what is lower motor neuron and then we'll be going to what we call as lesions and how you differentiate between the two. So we'll be discussing on that particular aspect. So definition and then differential diagnosis. So there are two words and this is for motor neuron. Motor neuron means the fiber which are arising from cerebral cortex, particularly motor area which is pre-central gyrus and those fibers of those neurons we call exons they form pyramidal tracts and this pyramidal tract will consist of a portion in motor cortex we call pyramidal cells or bait cells then the exon fiber of those cells will come down in the form of corona radiata then it will get converged at internal capsule then they will pass through brain stem and they will end in a spinal cord at anterior horn cell making a synapse with anterior horn cell nucleus these fibers right from the motor cortex or we call precentral gyrus up to anterior horn cell are upper motor neuron and anything which produces damage from right from motor cortex up to anterior horn cell we label that as upper motor neuron lesion and anything from anterior horn cell because from anterior horn cells now exon fibers of those anterior horn cell nucleus will give rise to anterior nerve root then spinal nerve, plexus, peripheral nerve, myoneural junction. So right up to myoneural junction, we we'll label that as lower motor neuron lesion. The word motor means the motor function will be affected. So this fiber are involved in motor movement. Fiber from cerebral cortex up to anterior horn cell upper motor from anterior horn cell up to muscle that is myoneural junction is lower motor neuron and damage to those structure upper motor neuron lesion lower motor neuron lesion so you can see here the these are the neuronal cells in precentral gyrus or motor nerve cells then these fibers will call that as upper motor neuron this will be corona radiata. This will be the portion of internal capsule. Then they will descend down in a brain stem that is midbrain, pons and medulla. At the level of medulla, lower part of medulla, the fiber will cross to the opposite side. 90% of the fiber will cross. 10% will remain on the same side. And they will end in anterior horn cell. So fiber now from anterior horn cell nucleus, these fibers along the anterior nerve root spinal nerve, plexus, peripheral nerve, up to myoneural junction. This will be lower motor neuron. This will be upper motor neuron. And this will be upper motor neuron fibers right up to anterior horn cell. So we call lower motor neuron, upper motor neuron, two division. So at the level of lower part of medulla, the fiber will cross at that level we call decussation. 
and then they will run as a lateral corticospinal tract which is consisting of 90% of the fiber. 10% of the fiber will remain on the same side. But before they end in anterior horn cell, they'll cross. But they will cross in anterior commissure and they will run as anterior corticospinal tract. And this will be called as lateral corticospinal tract. So that will be the upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. Now, if you see here, these are the presentation of what we call as a motor homunculus. Foot is close to the corpus callosum while head and face part is close to the lateral sulcus. Fiber from there via corona radiator, internal capsule, in midbrain, it will run in a crush. Then in the pons, the fiber will be little scattered. Again, they will converge in a pyramid part of medulla and in lower part of medulla, 90% of the fiber will cross to the opposite side. 10% of the fiber will run on the same side. And then they will cross via anterior commissure and they will end in an anterior horn cell. This is, we call as a pyramidal tract. So, Understanding of pyramidal tract is very, very important. Now, in internal capsule, this particular pyramidal tract, the leg fiber are most posterior and face fiber are most anterior. So, face is anterior, legs are posterior. And closely related to that, we have got thalamocortical tracts, temporopontine tracts, and we have got auditory and visual fibers or we call optic radiation and auditory fibers going to occipital cortex and temporal lobe. Auditory fiber will go to temporal lobe and visual fiber will go to occipital lobe. While anteriorly you will have a frontopontine fiber and frontothalamic fibers. Frontothalamic will be most anterior and frontopontine will be posterior to frontothalamic fibers. So, in anterior limb, you will have a frontopontine fiber. Then you will have a in genu, pyramidal tracts, posterior limb, corticospinal tract, corticopontine tract, corticorubral fibers. And then you will have a parietopontine fibers, etc while ascending tracts will be mainly thalamic radiation coming from the thalamus we call thalamocortical tracts which will be running in just posterior to pyramidal tract in a posterior limb in posterior limb and then they will end in post central gyrus of cortex that is sensory area so those will be all the fibers will be running in what we call mainly in posterior limb, mainly in posterior limb. There will be small portion in genu and small portion in anterior limb. And this will be the posterior, this will be entirely those particular and auditory fibers and optic radiation will be posterior to thalamic radiation. So if you just now have a attention. You can see these are the different fibers, upper motor neuron fibers running right from cerebral cortex. This will be corona radiator. This is corona radiator. Then they converge in internal capsule. They'll run on the same side in midbrain, in crust, in the center part of the crust. Then in the pons, they will be little scattered. And in upper part of medulla, they will be still running in a pyramid part on the same side. In lower part of the medulla, they will decussate. They will cross to the opposite side. 90 fiber will cross. Only 10 percent fiber will remain on the same side. This is lateral corticospinal tract. This is anterior corticospinal tract. And then they will run in a spinal cord in a lateral corticospinal tract. That is lateral column of spinal cord. And they will end in anterior horn cell before 
they will end in anterior one cell means indirectly the fiber will end on opposite side anterior one cell and from anterior one cell now you will get a fiber which we call as a lower motor neuron fibers and the fiber which has not crossed that is anterior corticospinal tract they will cross to the opposite side and then they will end in the anterior one cell means all the 100% of fiber has crossed to the opposite side before they end in anterior one cell. So lateral corticospinal tract, anterior corticospinal tract. Now you will see that how it runs. 90% of the fiber has crossed and they have ended in anterior one cell. Now you will see that 10% of the fiber which has remained on the same side but they cross to the opposite side in anterior crush before they end in anterior one cell. So that will be peculiar. This is anterior corticospinal tract, this is lateral, this is 90% of the fiber, this is 10% of the fiber. This fiber is decussated or crossed to the opposite side in lower part of medulla. This will remain in the same side in spinal cord, but before they end, they will cross to the opposite side and then they will end in anterior horn cell. Again, same labeling. Now this is a part of a corticospinal tract. We also call it a corticobulbar tract or corticonuclear tract, which is a part of the pyramidal tract. Just to summarize all, this pyramidal tract will innervate almost all cranial nerves bilaterally. Means right side pyramidal tract will innervate right side cranial nerve nucleus as well as left side cranial nerve nucleus. Only exception is to two that is lower part of the face, facial nerve, nucleus and 12th cranial nerve will be innervated by opposite side pyramidal tract. So right side lower part of the face will be innervated by left side pyramidal tract and my right side of tongue that is hypoglossal will be innervated by opposite side pyramidal tract. So this will be the two cranial nerves will be innervated by opposite side. Now you can just have a look. This is pyramidal tract. This is third cranial nerve innervation on both side. Fourth cranial nerve on both side. Abducent on both side. Trigeminal on both side. Abducent and trigeminal. So three, four, five, six. Now you can see the facial upper part of the face bilateral innervation but lower part of the face opposite side innervation opposite side. So I made it instead of red black. Then you can see nucleus ambiguous that is 9th and 10th bilateral innervation hypoglossal opposite side and accessory bilateral innervation. So only two portion that is lower half of the face, facial nerve, nucleus and 12th cranial nerve that is hypoglossal will be innervated by opposite side corticospinal tract or we call corticobulbar tract or corticonuclear tracts. Clear? So hypoglossal nerve is supplied supplies all intrinsic muscle and extrinsic muscle of the tongue except palatoglossus and possibly the geniohyoid muscle. This is, we'll be dealing in detail when we go to the hypoglossal nerve. And you can see that almost the hypoglossal nerve is innervated by opposite side. And also the 12th nerve nucleus will be bilaterally innervated bilaterally innervated and low hypoglossal nerve that is 12th cranial nerve one of the muscle will be innervated by only opposite side only opposite side so this is important so genioglossus is innervated by opposite side opposite side genioglossus and rest of the muscle is bilaterally innervated.
now this is regarding the face part lower half of the face is innervated by opposite side pyramidal tract lower half of the face will be by opposite side while upper part of the face is bilaterally innervated again it will be very clear so if you get the damage in a facial nerve nucleus it will be low motor neuron palsy and if you get the damage in the upper part you will have a upper motor neuron palsy where you will have only lower half of the face getting involved and when you get a lower motor neuron same side complete facial nerve will be involved complete facial nerve will be involved so if you get only lower half of the face this is lower half of the face this will be because of opposite side pyramidal tract damage so when you get the pyramidal tract damage in the upper part you will have a lower half of the face and complete half of the face will be involved if you got a lower motor neuron and in a tongue we have already told you if you get the damage at the hypoglossal nerve complete same side lower motor neuron palsy and if you get the damage in the pyramidal tract above the midbrain you will have upper motor neuron palsy involving opposite side genioglossus and also in upper motor neuron lesions you will have muscle weakness superficial reflex that is abdominal and cremastic reflex will be lost and plantar will be extensor will be talking of those you will have a class sniper rigidity because of increased tone in the muscle you will have increased tone it is described as spasticity because of inhibitory reticulospinal tract is involved and facilitatory will increase the tone in the muscle also we should be aware of bulbar palsy and pseudo bulbar palsy when there is a bilateral damage to cortico bulbar tracts we will have a pseudo bulbar palsy and when we have got only unilateral pyramidal tract damage above the brain stem we will have upper motor neuron damage in the cranial nerves there is one more word called progressive bulbar palsy this is associated with very frequently in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis we'll be discussing those particular now this is the main important slide what we are going to discuss means if there is a damage above the brain stem you will have weakness in muscles so power will be less than 5 while in case of a lower motor neuron whichever muscles are being involved the power will be zero weakness will be severe and zero so we usually use the word flaccid paralysis because the tone is zero while in case of upper motor neuron the tone is increased so we call spastic paralysis so there is hypertonia while there is a hypotonia in paralysis so we call flaccid paralysis or atonia because of increased tone the reflexes are exaggerated and you might get even a clonus while in case of a lower motor neuron deep tendon reflexes will be absent whichever are involved plantar will be extensor in case of upper motor neuron we call babinski sign will be positive while in case of a lower motor neuron plantar will be either normal or absent if there is a damage at the level of alpha s1 plantar reflex will be absent and if there is a damage above the level of alpha s1 you will have upper motor neuron lesion so plantar reflex will be extensor and if there is a damage below alpha s1 plantar reflex will not be affected it will be normal because of disuse of muscle which are weak person may develop disuse atrophy after a very long period while there will be neurogenic atrophy rapidly developing rapid development of atrophy 
Now conduction will be normal in case of upper motor neuron, while now conduction is very frequently being affected because the lower motor neuron is because of the damage to peripheral nerve, and that will produce findings in now conduction study. In case of upper motor neuron, usually fasciculation and fibrillations will be usually absent, while they will be almost always present in a lower motor neuron. Clonus because of increased tone, clonus will be very frequently present, particularly patellar clonus and ankle clonus, while in case of lower motor neuron, you will never have clonus. As far as the cranial nerve is concerned, in upper motor neuron, almost all cranial nerves are normal, bilateral, bubate of eye, jaw, pharynx, larynx and neck are little affected and not or not at all means by and large these are bilaterally innervated so usually we come across if there is a damage to say right side pyramidal tract you will have opposite side lower half of the face gone and opposite side tongue involved while in case of a lower motor neuron at the level of damage you will have a flaccid paralysis and there is one sign called as a Hoffman sign and a pronator drift will be present in case of upper motor neuron while this particular finding that is Hoffman sign and pronated drift will be absent in case of a lower motor neuron. So same thing explained here you will have a disuse atrophy in upper motor neuron while you will have atrophy in lower motor neuron which is almost 70 to 80 percent you will have a spasticity but during acute phase you might have a hypotonia while here always there will be hypotonia in lower motor neuron. Power will be diminished. Here power will be markedly reduced depending upon the area which is being involved. The weakness will be usually hemiparesis or quadruparesis or paraplegia means extensive weakness. While this will be focal, focal weakness. Here you will have a clonus and increased tone while here you will have a fasciculation. Extensor muscle means you will have a plantar reflex extensor while here in lower motor neuron usually it will be normal. Deep tendon reflex because of increased tone they will be exaggerated or may be absent during acute phase. While this will be hypotonic so reflexes will be absent. Sphincter function may be occasionally affected while here the sphincter will be normal in lower motor neuron unless there is a damage at the level. Now conduction study will be normal, EMG will be normal while now conduction study will be abnormal and even EMG will show you denervation potential that will be very peculiar we call fasciculations. So almost we have discussed the same upper motor neuron you will have a lesion of 15 to 20 percent only while this will be 80 percent spastic paralysis flaccid paralysis tone hypotonia hypotonia deep tendon reflex hyperreflexia and clonus this will be hypo fasciculation will be absent in upper motor neuron while it will be present fibrillation will be also absent in upper motor neuron while this will be present babinski will be extensor means plantar will be extensor while this may be absent if there is a damage at the level or it will be normal. Pronator drift will be very frequently present and Hoffman sign will be present in upper motor neuron while they will be absent in lower motor neuron. Same is repeated. So I am skipping this slide. Similar thing. Multiple slides are there showing you same difference. One difference may be here and there. So definition etiology, then muscle tone, hypertonia, class knife rigidity, deep tendon reflex will be exaggerated and clonus will be present, while here you will have hypotonia, because of interruption of stretch reflex, you will have even absence of reflexes, so deep tendon reflex will be absent, also superficial reflex will be absent at the level of damage. So superficial reflex here will be exaggerated. 
but uh, sorry superficial reflex like abdominal and cremastic will be absent and plantar will be extensor while this will be absent if you got damage at the liver muscle wasting will be disuse atrophy while this will be neurogenic atrophy and rapid fasciculation will be usually absent in upper motor neuron while they will be very frequently present and you will have a fasciculation and fibrillation in lower motor neuron by and large if you do a no conduction study in a no conduction study they will be affected in lower motor neuron while in upper motor neuron they will be absent so same thing is shown here now very frequently the damage to this tracks pyramidal tract will be because of vascular etiology so commonly it will be damage to cortex or internal capsule or in a descending tracks at brain stem level so you can get the damage in internal capsule you will have a motor loss hemiplegia you will have associated sensory loss also because thalamocortical tracks are present in internal capsule as well as you will have hemi anesthesia hemiplegia hemi anesthesia hemiplegia quite common and because of involvement of the optic radiation homonymous hemianopia opposite side so if there is a damage on the right side internal capsule you will have a left side homonymous hemianopia and also auditory fiber will be damaged so there will be diminished hearing acuity now difference between progressive bulbar palsy and pseudo bulbar palsy pseudo bulbar palsy will be bilateral lesions of upper motor neuron variety means if there is a damage above the brain stem while progressive bulbar palsy is a damage in the brain stem very frequently because of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis where you will have a low motor neuron type of lesion very frequently the nerve which are being affected is 10 9 10 11 and 12 are most commonly affected occasionally you can get 5 and 7 while in a pseudo bulbar palsy you will have a bilateral both side cranial nerves will have a upper motor neuron type of lesion 12th now in progressive bulbar palsy will show wasting fasciculation and the tone will be zero while there will be no wasting and fasciculation no fasciculation in pseudo bulbar palsy gag reflex will be diminished or absent while gag reflex will be brisk or exaggerated jaw jerk will be absent in case of progressive bulbar palsy while it will be brisk in case of a pseudo bulbar palsy so this gag reflex and jaw jerk helps to differentiate between progressive bulbar palsy and pseudo bulbar palsy aspiration will be very very common in progressive bulbar palsy while usually in a pseudo bulbar palsy we don't come across aspiration symptoms nasal regurgitation is more common in pseudo bulbar while it is not there because these are all lower motor neuron this is upper motor neuron you will have a peculiar nasal speech while this will be spastic speech because of basal ganglia involved you will have a parkinsonism very frequently with pseudo bulbar while there will be no evidence of basal ganglia damage so no parkinson syndrome frontal lobe release sign is absent while you will have a in a pseudo bulbar palsy you will have a sucking reflex being preserved emotional disturbances will be more common with pseudo bulbar and etiology as far as progressive bulbar palsy classical example amyotrophic lateral sclerosis poliomyelitis myasthenia gravis and gbs even diphtheria sorry not this myasthenia gravis multiple sclerosis while in case of a pseudo bulbar palsy classical example multiple infarct means repeated strokes encephalitis and multiple sclerosis so this will be the difference between upper motor neuron lower motor neuron progressive bulbar palsy which is a lower motor neuron and pseudo bulbar palsy which is upper motor neuron 
mainly involving the brain stem and above the brain stem so if you understand this chapter very frequently we'll be using the word in cranial nerves and in motor system examination etc we'll be constantly using a word upper motor neuron lower motor neuron etc so we should be very very clear regarding this particular so i hope this will be clear to you if you still find some problem you can contact me i'll explain you so if you like this particular lecture please don't forget to press button like subscribe and if you feel it will be helpful to your friends in your circle you can share with your friends because this is mainly educative purpose for educative purpose thanks for taking out time i know that your time is valuable and i appreciate you for spending some of the time with me see you in next lecture